Hello, and thank you all for joining us today. I am the ADR Vice President, Jane Weintraub, the Gary Rozier and Chester Douglas Distinguished Professor of Dental Public Health and former Dean at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Adams School of Dentistry, and an adjunct professor at the UNC Gilling School of Global Public Health. ADR will be hosting a series of webinars on topics related to COVID-19. Visit idr.com slash COVID-19 webinar series for more information on future webinars. If you'd like to receive continuing education credit for the webinar, you will need to attend the full duration of the webinar to receive the verification code and complete the required survey. Be sure to register for the next webinar, which is next Wednesday, August 12th, on dental oral and craniofacial research in the COVID era, featuring speakers Greg Gilbert from the University of Alabama, Birmingham, Lisa Cartonin of the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and Shannon Wallet of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and the session will be moderated by ADR President Mark Hertzberg from the University of Minnesota, Minneapolis. If you have any technical difficulties while viewing the webinar, you can use the WebEx chat window and message IADR Global Headquarters. You can see different things going on on the screen here. To access the chat window, hover over the bottom of the video window and press the speech bubble icon. If you are unable to access the chat window within WebEx, go to iadr.org and use the pop-up chat window in the bottom right corner and note that you need assistance with today's webinar. IADR staff will be happy to direct you and assist you. The WebEx chat window is also how we encourage you to ask questions for the Q&A portion of today's presentation. Select Ensure All Panelists in the drop-down menu so we can all see the question. You're able to submit questions at any point in the presentation, but they will not be addressed until the end of the presentation in the last portion of the webinar. Speaking today, is Dr. Yang Feng Ren, a professor and director of the Howard Dental Urgent Care at the Eastman Institute for Oral Health at the University of Rochester Medical Center in Rochester, New York. Dr. Ren provides general dentistry, provides didactic and clinical training for postdoctoral dental residents, and is a clinician scientist involved in clinical and translational oral health research. Today's presentation is the research response to a paper published in the JDR and Clinical and Translational Research by Dr. Ren and his colleagues titled Dental Care and Oral Health Under the Clouds of COVID-19. We're excited for your presentation today, Dr. Ren, and so I'll turn the program over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Untrao, for the introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to the IADR, AADR for this opportunity to, for me to speak with the AADR community about the safety, safety delivery of oral health care during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I have uh, no conflict of interest to be clear. So, so my focus uh, will be the effectiveness, effectiveness of our, our current level of protection against the risks from the COVID-19 to oral health care workers. So Eastman Institute for Oral Health, where I work, is a part of the University of Rochester Medical Center in Rochester, New York. So we have over 100 residents in nine different residency training programs. During the pandemic, so we have experienced the same difficulties in dental education research and patient care. 
I'm sure as everybody did in this audience. So here's a look at the number of the patients we saw from mid-March to last week. So, and, uh, so we shifted the, to emergency and urgent care only mode. So on March 16th, so the day ADA announced its guidance. So and it lasted to the first week of June. So when New York State announced the second phase of a reopening that allowed us to resume seeing elective patient. So we saw more than 5,000 dental emergency patients in that stretch, so which we think is not only important for the patient for relieving their pain and suffering, it was also a vital service to the community and the fight against the pandemic because otherwise some of these patients will end up in the hospital emergency rooms where doctors were already struggling so with the surge of those COVID-19 cases. So during that period, so we observed the CDC and the ADA guidance and increased our level of protection against an infectious disease. So including source control through pre-screening and on-site screening so to identify suspected and confirmed COVID-19 cases. So we can stop them from getting to our office pre-rinse with antimicrobial mouth rinses in our case. So we use hydrogen peroxide when we get here. So with the hope that this will eliminate the virus if there are, there are any so in the patient's mouth. So direct protection so against the droplets and aerosol using N95 mask and the goggle combination or surgical mask and the full face shield plus goggle com combination. So and the indirect protection against the full mask using gloves, guns, head covers, and emphasizing on hand hygiene. So compared to our standard of precaution, so the transmission-based precaution should represent a significant es escalation. So, uh, and we feel that it has provided adequate protection to our faculty, residents, and the staff. So and no work-related infection has occurred during the peak of the pan pandemic until today. So we have seen more than 20,000 patients from March to today. But this does not mean that we did not feel the anxiety that many of the dentists, hygienists, and the staff experienced during this period. So we feel it's every day for a variety of reasons. So this is the result of a survey of a dentist and hygienist attending a CDC webinar earlier June. So you can see that the majority of dental providers had some degree of anxiety about returning to work. So we found that the anxiety is mostly associated with the question about the effectiveness of protection and the many unknowns associated with a novel infectious disease. So at the beginning is the shortage of the PPE, especially the N95 mask, then how effective is this protection is this enough. So the most troubling nature of COVID-19 is of course the potential transmission from asymptomatic cases. So how likely is that I'll get the infection from a asymptomatic patient I have no way to identify. So will I get sick and die from disease if I'm getting infected by this uh, asymptomatic patient? So there's many other factors that we don't really know, especially how many viruses are in the saliva. So and if we get killed by the viruses in the aerosols, so if I use a scalar or high-speed handpiece. So all those questions are quite scary because we didn't really know the answer. So now it's eight months into the pandemic, so, and we know a lot more. So there are early 30,000 scientific particles, articles published on COVID-19, so of which at least 500 are related to dentistry. So from what we learned from available scientific evidence, we think that the risk of this disease to dental provider is likely much smaller than we or originally feared. So we will review the evidence and determine if and how we can safely deliver oral health care during the COVID-19 pandemic. So shortage of the PPE, especially the availability of the N95 mask was a big problem for us. As for many dental providers uh, in the beginning, so we had no N95 mask, no face shields in the middle match, so, so when the lockdown occurred. So we're very grateful to our friends and the alumni in China as they send us some of the much needed PPE early April, so before our supply improved. And eventually got what we need to protect us following the CDC guidance. 
So by the end of June, PPE supply has improved significantly, and the majority of the dentists have at least a two-week supply of N95 and surgical mask, face shield, and guns. But I understand that these masks probably are not really readily available from your regular supplier, and you need to look for them. So the supply probably is not a big problem, problem now, but how about the effectiveness? So will N95 mask provide adequate protection so against the droplets and aerosols that may contain virus. The N95 mask is not something new. It has been around since the 1970s. So there's many lab studies and systemic, systemic reviews on its, on its effectiveness in lab testing. So here I, click, I picked one paper that I think is most relevant. So this study tested the filtration efficiency of four different N95 masks, so against the human influenza virus and rhinoviruses. So the SARS-CoV-2 virus is about the size of the influenza virus, so we can assume that it, if it can catch the influenza virus, it should be able to catch the SARS-CoV-2 virus as well. So the result are pretty clear that N95, though it's rated at 95 efficient against the particles 0.3 micron in size, it could, could catch almost 100% of viable viruses that are smaller than 0.3 micron. So there's also many clinical trials showing the same 100% effectiveness against influenza and other respiratory diseases, but no clinical trial on COVID-19 has been done. So there are several, there are several uh, observational studies on COVID-19 included in this, in this review sponsored by the WHO. So this re review actually included the studies on the effectiveness of N95 masks and any other masks in both clinical and community settings against the SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. So and they did find that when any mask is quite effective in preventing this infection in any kind of setting. But here we are mostly interested in the effectiveness effectiveness of N95 mask in healthcare settings against the COVID-19. So we selected the studies that included N95 mask from the review and found another one through literature search. So combining, combining, uh, combining the result from those studies, we found that the infection rate is uh, about 2.83 in healthcare workers who did not use N95. So this is mostly in early stages of the pandemic. So one N95 was not readily available on the doc, or the doctors did not know that they were dealing with COVID-19 patients. So under the infection rate, it's 0.06 for those who did wear an N95 mask. So this finding is pretty consistent with clinical trials on other respiratory disease and lab testing. So how about the, how about the surgical masks? So the CDC guidance say that you can use a surgical mask in combination with a face shield to perform aerosol generating, generating procedure if you cannot get a hold of N95. But will it provide adequate protection? So this is a very informative graph that I found online compared to surgical and N95 masks. We know that they are made of the same material. So the dif difference is the testing standard. So the N95 requires an at least 95 filtration efficiency against particles 0.3 micron in diameter, but a level one surgical mask requires an at least 95 efficiency against particles 0.1 micron in diameter. So that's smaller. And the level three surgical mask requires actually a 98 filtration efficiency. So the surgical masks use a smaller particle, which is about the size of the coronavirus, which seems even better than the N95, let's use a bigger particle. So this is a, a little bit counterintuitive because the 0.3 micron particle is what's called the most difficult to catch. So, the, so they, they call it most penetrating particle size. So the 0 0.1 micron actually is a little bit easier to catch. So the filtration efficiency actually is the same, but the difference is, of course, we know the tight peripheral seal. 
with the N95. So that the surgical mask cannot achieve. So therefore the N95 usually performs much better than the surgical masks in laboratory tests, mainly because the seal. For this reason, so we often hear that the surgical mask is uh, to protect others from you and the N95 is uh, to protect yourself. But the result of the lab testing could not be uh, completely replicated by well-conducted clinical trials. And here's one trial that uh, concluded that the surgical mask is not really inferior to N95 in preventing lab-confirmed influenza, influenza, influenza and other respiratory virus infections in healthcare workers. So the systematic reviews of most studies also reach the same conclusion. So we can conclude that the N95 masks are very effective against the COVID-19 infection and the surgical masks so are not that worse and should be adequate when combined with the face shield as suggested by the CDC. So now let's look at the risk of getting infected by asymptomatic patients in healthcare settings. So I want to first establish that the COVID-19 is very cont contagious. So the attack rate is quite high in households at 10 to 18%. And the r not that uh, measures uh, transmissibility is uh, estimated to be by about uh, 2.5. So pretty close to that of the 1918 flu pandemic, but much lower than the measles, which is known to be caused by an airborne pathogen. So COVID-19 is a transmission is lower actually in the healthcare settings, but there are many clusters reported worldwide, worldwide among physicians. So more than 3,000 in China, 6,000 in Italy, and 9,000 in the US. So there's no confirmed COVID-19 transmission in oral health setting, or oral healthcare settings actually, but at least until uh, last week. So last week, Dr. Zhuan Bian, so in this web, webinar series, series did report two clusters of three cases where dentists might have gotten the infection from their patient, but this occurred before January 20. So those are, those are, those patients, those are before, actually before January 20, that's before the outbreak, outbreak was known to the public and nobody was using N95 masks yet. So there were also no nuclear acid tests to confirm the index cases indeed high to COVID-19. So at least after January 20, so when the Outbreak, outbreak became known to the public, so no dental professional has been reported to be infected by their patients. So one important measure for us dental provider is the prevalence of uh, asymptomatic cases in the community because if the prevalence is high, so we'll have a higher chance to encounter them in our practice. So this includes the truly asymptomatic patients and also the pre-symptomatic ones who will develop symptomatic symptoms in a later date, so that we have no symptoms at the time of uh, diagnosis by viral RNA tests. So the proportion of asymptomatic cases is about 40-45% in representative population samples. So the prevalence of asymptomatic patient, so, so it was reported to be about 0.33% in nationwide sampling in Iceland. So this is the most frequently used number. So in the city of war in Italy, so two city-wide city testings were contacted and the prevalence uh, actually was 1.07% uh, during the first time, first test. So that's in the height of the pandemic. And it was uh, much lower at uh, about 0.6% in a later date when the pandemic is uh, under control. So the US figures in Indiana and San Francisco is 0.76% and 0.94%, this is in April, or may and the population probably not a lot of representative, representative. And with uh, identical in two cities in China in late May or early June at 0.003%. So this is after the strict lockdown when there's no more community transmissions in the community. So you can see that prevalence can vary significantly depending on which stage of the pandemic is in the local community. And we do not have a population-based data. So in our area, but in the people who came to the medical center for treatment and testing, so the prevalence is uh, at 1.4%. So this is uh, last month. So and it's lower now, it's about 1%. So this number is quite high. 
because the population is not representative, representative and probably had more patients who had a close contact history with COVID-19 patients. So this rate says so at a national level would imply that there's uh, about 10 million patients in a given day in the US, which is highly unlikely at this time. So now let's uh, look at the risk of the COVID-19 transmission from asymptomatic patients. So several studies uh, did pretty thorough contact tracing of the diagnosed patient. So here are the results. So the risk of uh, transmission or attack rate from the symptomatic cases is reported 6.3%. For asymptomatic cases, 4.1%. Those are mostly in the household and the community contact. So there's two studies, if you look at the rate of the transmission from asymptomatic cases in healthcare settings, and uh, it all come up to zero. So this study also found that the second generation transmission from infections acquired from asymptomatic patient is lower than acquired from symptomatic patient. So the probability for infection acquired from a symptomatic patient becoming symptomatic it's about 85%. But if the infection is to get, you get an infection from asymptomatic, so the probability for you to become asymptomatic is much lower at 50%. So this uh, slide summarizes the numbers that we talked before. So, and we will use these uh, numbers later to estimate the risk in dental settings. The important ones are the prevalence rate, the transmission rate from asymptomatic cases, and also the probability to develop symptoms from an infection acquired from an asymptomatic patient. So now we'll look at the potential outcomes of a COVID-19 infection. So what is the probability that you will die from an infection acquired from an asymptomatic patient in dental office? So we'll first look at the three metrics of the disease severity, so the case fatality rate, infection fatality rate, and the infection fatality rate of a symptomatic patient. So CFR is the death rate of the diagnosed cases. So IFR is the death rate of all infected cases, including diagnosed and undiagnosed, which include asymptomatic cases that can only be identified through RNA or antibody test. And there's an IFR in symptomatic cases, so which is more important for us, to do our risk estimate because asymptomatic cases are not likely to die from the disease. So the IFR actually is anywhere between 0 0.3 and 1%. So the CDC now uses 0.65%. The WHO just said that the global is about 0.6%. So the IFR in symptomatic cases is at about 1.3% in the US which almost doubles that uh, total FR, as you can see, and it is probably right, as only about half of the patient are symptomatic, and they are the ones that are likely to die. So this is the, but this is the overall estimate. And we know that the fatality rate of this disease is very much age dependent. So this is the data from the region of uh, uh, Lombardy in Italy. So very low at 0, 0.0. 1% of those below 40, but much higher at about 18% in those over 90 years of age. So the US data is very similar, as you can see that it's quite low, at, uh, or below 1% of those uh, younger than 70, but much higher in those older than 70. Okay, so with this data, so we could uh, very roughly estimate the probability for a dental provider to acquire an infection from an asymptomatic dental patient and it dies from the infection, of course. So the calculation is uh, done with the help of a uh, biostatistician. So here's the most aggressive estimate using the prevalence rate of 1.4% that implies on the national level, there will be about 10 million infected patients in a given day in the US. So the overall risk for a dental provider who sees 10 patients per day, works 212 days a year. So it's a, about one to 13% or 0.008% per year. So to put this number in some perspective, so the probability of death from a motor vehicle accident 
is one to 8,000 in the US. So you're much more likely to die from a traffic accident than from COVID-19. Uh, when you see that you might get by seeing patient. So uh, of course the risk is very much age dependent. So it's close to zero to anyone below the age of 70 and it could reach one to 1,000 or 0 0.1% for those over 90. So, but this means that even you are 90 years old and continues to see 10 patients a day for 212 days per year, you still have a 99.9% chance of coming out okay. So but the prevalence rate for this estimate is not very uh, realistic and it is certainly an overestimate, overestimate of the true risk. So this one actually is much more closer to the real number. So especially if you know area, if in your area, if there's a normal community spread of the street lockdown, so they are essentially zero in most age groups. So we did submit this uh, estimate and uh, for peer review to the Journal of Dentistry and they did pass and uh, it will be published soon. So there are a few other factors that we did not consider but it will affect the risk. So one is the underlying health and the genetic condition uh, conditions. So both the China CDC and the US CDC data show that the people with underlying health conditions such as a cardiovascular disease have a much higher case fatality rate. So if you have uh, these conditions, you have an increased risk. There's uh, also a lot of emerging uh, evidence about genetic predisposition for severe illness, including cardiovascular and respiratory failure failures in seemingly healthy individuals. So the one got the most attention is the association between ABO blood type and the respiratory failure. The A blood type seems to have a higher risk than the non-A types. Okay, the other factor that is very important to us is the saliva viral load in COVID-19 patients. First, let's review how the disease might be transmitted from droplets or aerosols from the saliva. So definition of a dry droplet versus an aerosol is very controversial. So generally, so infection disease specialists define large droplets as more than 100 micron in size, uh, in diameter. The, 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 those, they cannot, uh, those droplets cannot fly far, so unless they are sneezing. So. And uh, but they are the main uh, vehicles for transmission in close contact. So medium droplets are those between five and 100 micron. And uh, those smaller ones, those between five and 20, can hang in the air for quite a while sometimes, maybe for from several minutes to a few hours, depending on the ventilation rate or relative uh, humidity in the room. So small droplet will drop the nuclei, also wall aerosols. Now those are smaller than five microns, so they can travel a longer distance in the air. But I found that the aerosol scientists do not like this definition at all. So they generally think that any droplets that can fly in the air and get into a person's uh, respiratory tract is an aerosol. So the 100 micron droplet is also an aerosol to them because you can breathe them in in short distance. So how many viral RNAs are in the saliva of a symptomatic and asymptomatic patients? So the data on this is relatively thin. So because few studies quantified the viral RNA copies. So the first look at the sputum. So this is from a very highly cited paper about a viral load dynamic so in hospitalized patients in Germany, so they measure the, the viral RNA copy numbers in sputum and it was about seven times to, to the sixth power, that's about seven million per milliliter. So another study reported two cases and they are about the same range. So the numbers in the saliva were reported lower, so it was 3.3 times 10 to the sixth power, that's about 3.3 million per, mill per milliliter. And the second study reported two patients that are a bit higher, but also in the same range. So those are the hospitalized the symptomatic patients. So I, I could find any study 
reporting the saliva viral load in asymptomatic patients. So the only study that I could find is to try to detect RNA in the saliva of asymptomatic cases from the in two weeks of repeated testing that, uh, of those 98 cases, two saliva samples turned out positive, but those positivity, positivity was not confirmed by nasopharyngeal swabs. So this is one study that did find viral RNA in two out of three asymptomatic children. So under the viral RNA load is uh, about 3.3 .3 times 10 to, uh, and uh, 3.2, times 10 to the five power per milliliter. So that is uh, 10 times lower than the symptomatic adult cases. So let's look at the probability of a saliva aerosols becoming viral RNA with those, this kind of uh, viral load numbers in mind. So for, spu for Sputin, Statnitsky, so and, uh, and his group in NIH reported that the probability for 50 micron droplet to contain one copy of a viral RNA in this viral load and in the sputum is a 37%. So 10 micron is a 0.37% and a three micron is only about 0.01%. That is uh, every 100 of aerosols may contain one copy of the virus RNA. So similarly, we can calculate this for saliva, probably the probability for 50 micron for the 50 micron droplet to contain one copy of the RNA is 22%. The 10 micron is 0.17% and three micron is only 0.047%. 0.0047%. So this is a, about, so every 200 of aerosols may contain one copy of the viral RNA. So this figure is drawn by some uh, aerosol scientists to show that there are a lot of more smaller uh, aerosols generated from the sneeze, but did not really account for the number of uh, virus in the sputum. So this can only happen if you have unlimited supplies of the virus, which is not the case. So let's look at the saliva. So and the aerosol generated from a high-speed handpiece. So let's first assume that you just use the air to aerosolize the undiluted, undiluted saliva that contain about 3.3 million copies of the viral RNA per milliliter. So the probability for the aerosols to contain virus definitely will not look like this because you don't have that many in the saliva. So it will more probably look like this. So you might have a couple in those, uh, in those uh, big ones. But the small ones, you, you need a couple hundred of them to have one. So this is without the use of a suction or water coolant. So if you remove the saliva and use coolant, so this will, so, and the saliva will be diluted a hundred times. So then chance for any aerosol to contain any viral particle is extremely, extremely small. So, so far that we were talking about, uh, we only talk about the, viral RNA load. So one thing that we need to be clear is that uh, there are uh, viral RNA in the saliva does not mean there are viable viruses or virus or variants in the saliva. So to know if there might be viable virus, viruses in the patient mouse, we need to know where the virus might come from. So, so they, sent, they certainly can come from the upper and the, the lower res respiratory tract because so that they at, anatomically connect to the mouse where our pharynx. So they can also shed from the salivary glands. So what the oral mucosa and they both, as they both have a, those AC receptors that the virus can use to enter the cell. So when you do a DNA test, you could find the viral RNA in cuffed and jute or self collected saliva in most patients. But if you wipe out the pooled saliva and collect the saliva from the duct opening of the salivary gland, so you could not find much in uh, hospitalized patients with, uh, um, who have uh, moderate symptoms, but you do find them in those uh, most severely ill cases in the very late stage of the disease. So those are respirators. So, so they conclude that the virus might not be shed from the salivary gland so, until you're very late. So this is very important to us. So if the saliva is mostly from the respiratory tract, so we can ask our patient to rinse, 
and clean their mouth, and they will have no virus in their mouth, at least temporarily when you treat this patient. So unless they have to spit in the middle of the treatment. So then you need to ask them to rinse again. So, so there's only one study try to find the viable virus from the saliva, viable virus from the saliva, and I found only three out of the five patients who have millions of viral RNA copies in their saliva actually have uh, viable viruses. So, so we should know uh, saliva is the first land, land of uh, defense against the virus because it contains many antiviral proteins, uh, peptides and microRNAs, and it's naturally virucidal. So it has been shown that a human saliva can strongly inhibit the H1N1 virus. So the SARS-CoV-2 virus may not survive very uh, well in human saliva. So we need a, definitely need to uh, look, into, uh, look into that. We do need more data. So how about uh, those antimicrobial, uh, antimicrobial oral rinses? So you can actually put some of the disinfectants in your mouth and rinse with them. So the providone iodine rinse, so that con concentrations between 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 1.5 percent can inactive, uh, inactivate the virus very quickly in 15 seconds, and much more effective than the 70 percent alcohol. So this is also evidence that the chlorhexidine might work as well. So this is a study on two hospitalized COVID-19 patients. You can see that uh, at least in two occasions, the mouth rings completely cleared the virus from the oral cavity by at least two hours. So then the virus come back. So this also supports that the virus was from the respiratory tract and not to continue to shed from the mouth, at least in some patients, but this is only for two patients. So more work will need to be done to conform, conform this findings to this. So, okay, so we all know that the dental treatment generates aerosols. So, but where do all the aerosols go? So, and how much can reach the breathing room of the dental providers? So this is a study looking at the effect of an air cleaners on dental aerosols in a perio clinic. So we only needed to look at the, the, this uh, three columns, which is the baseline without the air cleaners working. So you can see the aerosols smaller than 20 microns. So only less than 0.2.5% can reach the breathing room of the dental providers. And less than 1% can reach the body surface of the dental providers. And then more than 90% are trapped in the patient body surface. So I'm, I want to clarify that they did not uh, uh, really use any, any suction. They did not any any suction, and only used the ultrasonic scaling and a handpiece of about thirty thousand RPM. So this is not a high speed handpiece. So to summarize, so the probability for dental aerosol to contain any viable virus to reach the breathing room of a dental provider is extremely low. So you are, so if you are wearing a mask and the patient is rinsing with the mouthwash, you are probably very safe. So for us, uh, dental providers, the protection against those large droplets may be more important because they are more likely to contain viruses. So we'll have a goggles and a face shield as part of a standard precaution. So there are uh, plenty, plenty of uh, clinical evidence that they work as shown in, uh, by this uh, systematic review. So eye protection is especially important for COVID-19, as uh, several studies have reported the eye symptoms in this patient, and there's also a theory that the, conjunct the conjunctiva so might be a site of entry for the virus because it does have the ACE2 receptors that the virus like. So face shield is very effective against droplets in short distance, can stop 96% of them from reaching you, from reaching your face if somebody, somebody really directly cough at you. So for this reason, some experts even suggested to use facial to replace it. It was a fabric mask in the community because you can see the facial expression and easier to clean and, and also effective. 
So from the evidence we know, so we're pretty confident that we can safely deliver oral health care to our patients. So if we follow the CDC and the ADA guidance, but as the pandemic is still evolving, some of the evidence I presented here might change. So then we might need to reassess, reassess the risk. So I'll use the next few minutes to talk about the opportunities for improvement. So this is a section of the CDC dental guidance on engineering controls. So I summarized the main concept here. So many of these terms are not really something that we're familiar with. So the whole HVAC and the ventilation business business is quite complicated. So I found that there's uh, not one, but uh, several professions devoted to it. So I'll talk a little bit about the portable air cleaners and the upper room UV that we mentioned in the CDC guidance. The CDC guidance didn't mention negative pressure rooms at all. So this is something that we might need to look into as well if the pandemic is not going away or if just some other ones that keep coming. So the key to the portable air cleaner is the HIPAA filter. So it is rated 99.97 efficient against the 0.3 micron particles. You, you often see that uh, in the description of those uh, filters and uh, so that they say that they can remove particles as small as 0.3 micron. So, but all virus smaller than that, so it gives you a feeling that they might not work against virus. So we talked about this when we discussed the N95 mask. So this is a, actually a misnomer because as the filters are much more effective in capturing particles smaller than the 0.3 microns. There's a lot of studies that show that the, pr the portable air cleaners are effective in resins, residential office, industrial buildings, and in healthcare settings, especially in, in the infection, infection disease unit. But very few studies in its use in dental office. I could only find two papers. So a very early one in 1970 and the one that's uh, in 2010 in the Perio Clinic, so as mentioned uh, earlier. So the 1970 article was published in GDR. So the cleaners does not look at very portable at that time, but it was very effective in removing vi viable bacterial particles in dental offices when, they, when it is continuous on. So the data is pretty clear. So this study, this newer study is much more complicated. And look at the particles uh, uh, sizes from 0 0.3 to 20 micron. Uh, through both on-site measurement and also computer fluidic uh, modeling. So they looked at the placement of the cleaners and its, its effect uh, on air cleaning efficiency. So they look at the five scenarios. So one is the, when it, with the cleaner off, two is the corner, uh, placed in the corner of the room, three is uh, placed by the patient feet, four is uh, placed by the patient head, and the five is placed behind the dental provider. So this study design did not include a second provider such as a dental assistant. So they found that the air cleaning the cleaner worked very well, except when placed behind the dental providers. So this, that's the behind the dental. So you can see from this uh, graph, actually, all three occasions are really not much left uh, when you turn on your, uh, your cleaner. So they even made a zooming map and suggested that uh, the best, best place so will be close to patient head, so away from the dental provider. But this might be problem, problematic if you have a dental assistant. So another, so if I, so this might get in the way. He might be getting in the way. So another choice is close to patient feet and uh, away from the air supply inlet, inlet and exhaust. So in this setup, so this will be the best location if you work alone. So, and it should be here in the back, by the close to the feet. So if you have the no assistant working with you. So I can conclude that the portable air cleaners are really works, but the placement in the room is very important. 
So let's briefly look at the UV, the upper room UV. So those are the UV lights you mount on the ceiling or wall, so at least seven feet above the ground. So, so when uh, the virus flew into the range of the germicidal zone, what they call it, so they get zapped and inactivated. So this requires the areas where it will mix and the virus will float to the top of the room, so which they usually do, especially when the ventilation is not really that good. So there's significant evidence that to show upper room UV works well against the floating microbials, but its effectiveness is also affected by the ventilation rate, by the relative humidity and air mixing. And this is especially helpful if your ventilation is not that good and, uh, and you have no way to improve your HVAC system. In that case, you should consider the option of UV. So at the end, so I'll come back this slide and conclude that we should be able to deliver oral health care safely based on current scientific evidence. And we probably need to look into our ventilation system and consider using portable air cleaners and upper room UV as a level of improvement for the future, especially in an environment of a frequent infectious disease uh, pandemics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ren, for a really wonderful, very comprehensive presentation about providing dental care safely during this COVID era. We can now open the floor for questions from the audience. If you'll please put your questions in the chat and then I can read them out to Dr. Ren. While we're waiting for people to um, type in their questions. I was wondering if you have any thoughts about when a point of care test for the virus is available, if you think that dental providers should offer that service in their offices. Uh, yes, uh, actually, so I, I do think that, that would be very helpful, very useful. So I think that I actually at the beginning we thought about in doing that, but we just could not get hold of a, uh, uh, like a, a point of care test kit that we can use in our clinic. Because we thought that during the pandemic, so that this is one thing that we can use it to really screen the patient, to really identify the patient that uh, probably that uh, have a higher risk of a transmitted disease in a dental clinic. So the other the other role is uh, probably that we, we can contribute. To fighting the pandemic by by identifying those cases, so but I think that's probably in the, in in, the, in those two folders that should be very important. But unfortunately, so that we cannot get a hold of them. So we did try actually talk with Abbott many times to see if we can get one. So we just they, they just said that they don't have one for us. <laughs> but I think that would be a very very good if we can do that. So you know we can get a result in a few minutes. So that would be very 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 good. Okay, we have several questions in the chat box now. The first one is, what is the risk to operatories being exposed to UV light over long periods of time? Okay, so so that's that's a, if this is talking about the upper room UV, so that uh, so the UV the UV light the upper room UV actually is uh, all always on, so, so you can turn it on, so it's on all the time, so the people can work in the in the room, but it does uh, uh, highest uh, the risk of uh, of a scatter, and so you do need a professional to help really to install it and also to measure it to so make sure that you do not have the uh, have the exposure. So I think that they do have uh, uh, professionals to do that. Thank you. The next question is, what do you recommend about head covering? Is there any evidence that the virus can be spread from hair? And then also we heard from uh, Wuhan that they were using foot coverings as well. Okay, the foot, the head coverings so we do use. So I think, uh, so I think that uh, because that's close to uh, 
to where we, we, we operate our head is pretty close to the patient's mouth. So there's a there's so the and there are also studies to show that uh, the spatters do get you to get onto your hair your head. So that uh, so I think that you probably that uh, it's very important you cover your hair so you don't really want to bring them uh, bring them home. So that I think uh, that's that's very important. So we do use it. So for the foot cover uh, the the foot covering. So we also consider that. So there are some evidence. To show that uh, that uh, especially the, in the ID in the infectious disease unit, so so you can find the virus on the floor. So if this uh, get on you to your feet, so you might uh, bring it with you somewhere else, and also they might uh, like uh, secondarily get into the air, so that uh, so the so the foot, foot covering uh, will be helpful. But I, then we think that for that to happen in a dental office, for the risk, the chance is probably probably extremely low, low or, or, or non-existent. So, so we do have uh, foot coverings. So I don't, I don't think we ever use that in the clinic. Okay, this next question is one that's particularly important because the recommendations have changed recently. How much time would you recommend in waiting between patients in the same operatory? Okay. So this is a difficult one. <laughs> so because I, we know that uh, the, uh, the CDC did recommend that a 15 minutes waiting time. So uh, and then they removed it. So so the, the science behind it is is is, a, is a very really unclear. So this very much depends on the ventilation and uh, also uh, uh, I mean the air exchange rate and also the settling uh, characteristics statistics of all those uh, aerosols that might be floating in in, uh, in your office um, but what we think is we can improve the air change rate so that's something that is probably difficult because of, because of the time issues I didn't really have time to talk more about the portable air uh, cleaners because of how much they can add to the air change under the, uh, the, the ventilation actually they can add a lot so so that uh, you probably I think that usually that uh, uh, if uh, you have a single room dental office, so usually the code, and it's at least in New York State, that require you have at least a six air change per hour. So and uh, so then uh, then a lot of those uh, portable air filters. So if you have about if you have a room about 100 square feet, so so that uh, if you put a, a put a air one of the air portable air cleaners on. So you can increase that to probably 20 to 25 air change per hour. So that 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 will add a lot. So if we have an adequate airflow, and so and if you keep it on while you're doing the procedure, so there are evidence actually shows that really there's not much aerosol in 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 the air, and also that we know that the probability for the aerosol to have any any virus is, is probably very very small. And so, uh, so my own, my personal opinion is that we do not really need to wait, so that we can uh, see our next patient. And uh, so, but we do need to follow the disinfection procedures that uh, specified by the CDC and use uh, effective disinfectant. So that that is my my opinion. Following up with that, would you have different recommendations for some dental clinics? Such as in dental schools where we have big open bays and they're not closed uh, operatory. Uh, again, so that will be a difficult one. So because you can see that uh, I think a lot of uh, this uh, uh, th this uh, this issues are related to uh, to the ventilation rate, and so we don't really know much about it at this moment. But as I said, that I try to really understand more. But I found that they really have a few professions to deal with this kind of stuff, so I don't really so have enough uh, knowledge uh, really to to address the ventilation issue. But the only thing that I think that I, I, we can understand is that uh, that we we might be able to uh, to use those uh, portable air filters to improve the ventilation really significantly, and also that this uh, so I mentioned about the upper room UV. Actually, if you listen to the aerosols scientist. So they are they are also that uh, recommended. So if you cannot improve the ventilation in your room, so that sometimes uh, uh, we know it's difficult 
So those upper room UVs might help, might, might be helpful. Thank, thank you. We have another question that's come in. If you have any recommendations regarding nitrous oxide sedation. Uh, I, I do not really understand this question. So why uh, to, to use them? I mean, the risks to using nitrous oxide? Question, has any recommendations for nitrous oxide sedation or any evidence in nitrous oxide use? Oh, so I, I do not really uh, know how to answer that question. So if it, if the question is about the risks associated with the nitrous oxide, so that I, I as 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 I think I do I do not think that uh, uh, that uh, uh, you have uh, uh, increased risk that uh, if you follow the guidelines and uh, and using uh, using the uh, proper uh, protection. Uh, so I, I do not think that that should be a problem. Other, other messages that have come into the chat is that this was an excellent presentation. So you have a lot of accolades. Thank you to Dr. Wen, Ren and thank you to Dr. Weintraub for um, being part of today's presentation and thank you everyone for joining us today. Okay, thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye.